<laughs> without. Welcome to another episode of the Dawn of Shades. I'm your host, Gia Scott, and today is April 13th, 2010, this is episode 404. More about this program and the guests that have provided us with such fascinating conversations can be found on our website, www.exogenynetwork.com. The Dawn of Shades always tries to bring interesting people right to the audience to hear about both new and old ideas. We focus on the people, places, and ideas that don't always make the mainstream news, the sorts of things that are frequently labeled as alternative or paranormal. Now, for the show tonight, if you would like to have a question asked, you can email me at gscott at gmail.com or through the virtual auditorium on Caltalk by Tech. I do monitor both the email and the virtual auditorium, so if you're wanting to shoot me a message, feel free. If I miss it in the virtual auditorium the first time, feel free to send it through again, and maybe I'll catch it on that scrolling screen. Now, for those who are listening on a podcast after the live uh, show, go ahead and send me your questions. I'll try to get those answered for you, too. And for everybody who likes to feel connected, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. You can link to me there. There's also a Dawn of Shades fan page on Facebook, and you can look for that, too. If you like to read, I've got articles on a variety of subjects available. And if you're a foodie, you can even see what I've been cooking up here lately. Now, tonight, we are fortunate enough to have both a guest and a guest co-host on the program. We've got a fantastic topic to explore, too. As we talk with Wendy Wolf about her life as an animal communicator and so much more. We are also quite fortunate to have the insight of someone who is knowledgeable about animal communicators herself. As the designer of Companion Animal, Oracle Cards, Angelica Del Morris. So, without any more delay, let's welcome Angelica and Wendy to the program tonight. And Angelica, as the guest co-host, you get that hot seat first. So, would you introduce yourself to the audience? Hello, I'm Angelica Del Mar. I created the messages from your Animal Companion 55 card deck for animal communication. In addition... I am an energy healer. I incorporate Reiki, sound, crystals, color, and positive affirmations into my healing practice. And uh, my path just continues to unfold with each new day. So who knows what I'll be doing in a few months. Thank you for uh, inviting me to co-host. Yes, and do you have a website too? www.angelicascards.com. And I'm also on Facebook. Okay. And Wendy, would you introduce yourself to the audience so that they understand the many facets that you're involved with in regards to your work with animals? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, Wendy Wolf, and I do animal communication. I'm also an animal wellness educator. So my work involves communicating telepathically with animals, but also some holistic and alternative healing methods. I am trained in essential oils for animals, uh, trained in a method that uses kinesiology and traditional Chinese medicine concepts. I also am trained in cranial sacral therapy, which I use primarily for horses, but also for dogs. And I also do my sort of own style of energy healing work. I'm located in central Wisconsin, but I serve clients literally all over the world. I teach classes here at my own place, but I also teach in other places, in Athens, Greece, um, in 
the United States in different areas and wherever I'm called to go to. And what I teach is the animal communication and also the essential oil therapy. And I've been doing this for about 10 years. Oh. And you have a website and a newsletter yourself, too, don't you? I do, and it's just wendywolf.com. Wolf has an E on the end, W-O-L-F-E. And if you go on there, you can sign up for my newsletter, which comes out with words of wisdom from animals that I communicate with, as well as little tidbits here and there about uh, wellness and keeping your animals happy. Okay. And if you're having trouble remembering all those wonderful websites, uh, both Angelica and Wendy do have a page on the Exogeny Network website. So if you click there, it will give you the links to go to their websites as well. Okay. Well, it is definitely not winter anymore here in New Orleans, and I'm sure it's the same in California. But how's the weather right there in Wisconsin this time of year? Well, normally this is not the best time of year. It's kind of cold, but we have been having an early spring, and it, today it is sunny and gorgeous and a bit windy, but we have had just an amazing early spring. Aha. Uh-huh. Well, that's nice to hear. Um, you know, I've been talking to family in uh, Minnesota, just east of you, and or west of you, rather, and uh, weather was nice today, but it hasn't been so nice here lately. So, well, uh, yeah, it's nice been cold for a few days, but it was, um, you know, it was like 80 degrees a lot, you know, a week and a half ago. Uh-huh. That's true here in New Orleans, too. It was 80 degrees a week and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, but our, our 80 degrees isn't going to last too terribly long. Pretty soon we'll be pushing it in the 90s. It's pretty warm today. It was making me take air conditioner thoughts. I happen to be, you know, one of those people that resists the urge to turn on the air conditioner until it's absolutely unbearable. Um, Red starts filing complaints. She doesn't do well with the heat. Cats love it, though. Cats seem to... to like heat much better than they do cold weather. Yes. They like the heat, though. Seek out those warm spots. Yes, yes. Top of the uh, radiator. All winter long, they uh, argued over who got the bed closest to the radiator. Yes. I have a little radiator I always kept on low for, for them to lounge around. Cause they, you know, they like radiant heat uh, much more than forced air heat. So, yeah, they would argue about who got what bed because one bed was on the side where the dog was you know the traditional dog cat thing goes on in my house too so um yeah <coughs> so Wendy you know in your work with animals um I know you've had to have some really unique situations arise what is the oddest one you have ever dealt with uh, let's see. Well, oddest or funniest? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you my funniest parrot story. How's that? Okay. I was, it, and I should preface this by saying, when I do the communication, 95% of the time I'm not physically with the animal, and I've never met the animal. I would, you know, somebody emails me a photo, mails me a photo, and I connect, sometimes even just the description. But in this case, um, I was, and this was quite a few years ago, I was communicating with a parrot, and the parrot was in another city. And the woman and I were talking, and the parrot had shared with me that, one, it wanted to be room to move to a different room because its baby was actually in the other room. And um, there were a couple of other things that the parrot had sort of conveyed to me, which is that it wanted, and, and I passed that on to the woman. And then I got this sensation of this burning smoke in my nostrils. And when this happens, this is, um, you know, this is sort of an empath- uh, empathic ability that I have and, and many communicators do. And so I said to the woman, not, I don't know, just an intuitive sense that the family didn't smoke, but I said to her, does anybody smoke in your family? And she said, no. And I said, well, I'm getting this sense of burning smoke from the parrot, and it's really something that's been distressing her. I said, let me check again. So I check in with the parrot again, and she 
really clear there's this burning smoke. So I went back and I said to the woman, I said, yeah, I, it's pretty clear there's a source of smoke that's irritating her. And then there's like this island on the other end of the phone. And I'm beginning to question, well, am I going nuts here? <laughs> and then, uh-huh. she says, then she asked me, well, this is confidential, right? I mean, anything that I tell you, you won't tell anybody. It's like I'm talking to a therapist, right? And, of course, I would never divulge her name. I don't even remember it or what city she was in. But I said, of course, it's confidential. And then she told me, she said, well, you see, my husband likes to smoke a joint now and then. And usually he smokes outside, but it's been really cold, so he's been smoking inside lately. I said, well, <laughs> tell him to stop because it's really bothering the parrot. So that was the parrot that narked on the husband. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that not only do animals understand a great deal of what's going on around them, but they have personalities and they have strong likes and dislikes sometimes. Yeah. You know, and, and do, the, do you often get consulted about situations where um, the animal seems just extremely unhappy or quarrelsome with everybody all of a sudden over, say, a change of some sort that is really bothering, mostly because of the animal's personality. Yes, that does happen. And I'll say, too, though, and it isn't, the the personality is part of it and um, how, you know, what they may have experienced before they came together has an effect on it. And also the person's energy and how they react to it has an effect on it. There are a lot of different things that come into play, but then sometimes, I mean, it is true that their personalities can come through very clearly. Some, um, you know, I've, I've talked to a few animals that really believe they're the princess or queen of the house, and, you know, they just, if they're not given their royalty status, they are not happy campers. Yeah, I live with an empress of the universe, so I do understand that. <laughs> uh, the only authority she really uh, recognizes is me versus anybody else in the house. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, Red is, has always been like that. But she's also the one that was here first. Right. <laughs> so I can kind of understand it. Right. Uh-huh. And they do and they do have that sense of... Um, you know, I was here first, I'm the oldest, therefore I should be the leader. Yeah, and, and well, for one thing, Brad, um, for several years we fostered uh, rescue dogs, and normally the ones, because Red's a good-sized dog herself. Anybody who's curious about her, if you look on, my, on the website, you will see pictures of her sprinkled here and there. She's a red dog with a black face, easy to recognize. But... Um, I would get these these large dogs, about a year old, and they usually had no manners. The best scenario was the one that when I brought him into the house the very first time he'd just gotten here, the first thing he did was land on the dining room table, right smack dab in the center. That was that was the first thirty seconds. I mean, they have no manners. They have no clue how to behave. Um, these were dogs that had ended up banished to somebody's backyard until they they relinquished them. So when they would come to stay with us, they had to be housebroken. They had to learn manners. They often had issues like uh, excessive barking and whatnot. And Red was the perfect dog because excessive barking. See, as Empress of the Universe, she would pick her spot in the yard and, you know, survey her, her realm, you know. And any barking indicated that there was something that required investigation. So when the other dog would start barking, um, she would trot over to investigate. And if it was nothing, well, she'd throw him down on the ground and rough him up a little bit and then resume surveying her realm. And within a week, they had stopped excessive barking because if it was something real to bark at, she would join in. Mm-hmm. And if it was nothing, then she would literally just throw him down and sort of mauled on him a little bit and, and then went back to surveying her realm. And it was very, very efficient. It was much better than <laughs> me out there yelling, stop, quit, uh, shut up, or whatever, because it was a very natural way to teach these dogs that that was not going to work. 
And then I was in charge of housebreaking them, you know, the manners thing. She wasn't going to deal with that. But, you know, she just naturally had assumed this bossy role all along. And so as the other members of our family joined us, she was has never been willing to uh, relinquish that role. She's also the largest. Oh, yeah, she's much larger than, obviously, than a cat. But I also have the two cats who decided they want to live with me, not vice versa. So I have a, a regular little zoo here. I've been outnumbered for years. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have pets of your own? Yes. Uh, six horses. Five dogs. Just recently adopted another dog from the Humane Society, a little West Highland Terrier. And four cats and one goat. Uh-huh. And now, I've had goats acres. in the past. <laughs> Pardon? And fortunately, ten acres. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with a, a menagerie like that, you do need a little bit more space than in a suburban yard. And I've had goats in the past myself, so, you know, I'm familiar with the fact that they do make good pets. But a lot of people, you know, they think of the cartoon Billy Goat eating tin cans. And that's all they know about goats. Or maybe they petted a uh, pygmy goat at a zoo somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, what is it really like for people to have a goat as a pet? Well, and she she's only alone because we had three goats to begin with, and the other two eventually died of old age. Um, and they were all rescued at one time or another from, you know, going to a chopping block. But it's funny because the goat that we have now... Seba is her name, is a lot like a dog. I mean, she's got her own little area that she's kept, you know, um, a fenced-in area and a little, we call it the goat condo. But when we come down to do chores, we open the gates, and she's running around with us and follows us around, and she actually behaves better sometimes than the dogs do. <laughs> yeah, so she'll yeah. go around with us, but and she'll play with us, and she'll play with the dogs. I mean, they're just really very... Um, sweet, and she never gets into anything, you know, she doesn't chew on things or anything like that, um, probably because she's getting all the nutrients she needs, so she doesn't have to get into trouble that way, but she's, um, she's really quite fun. One of the funniest goat stories I have, and this is personal experience because I ended up being the rescuer in the situation, my younger sister, when we were teenagers, had a goat that she had raised. And one day, we had also had a Jeep, and one day she had the hood up on the Jeep. She was, you know, doing the, the, the check on, on uh, fluids and oil and all that. And she left the hood up to go inside to get, I think, water it was. The hood was left up, and the goat was loose because we were right there. Now, goats are very, very curious, and this one was apparently very curious about what was going on in the engine and fell into the engine feet first and was stuck with his hind or her hind feet sticking out of the, the top of the engine and her front feet were all the way down to the ground. It, this was not a, a very probably a very comfortable position. No. But it also meant the only way to get her out was to end up standing on the bumper of the Jeep and hoisting her up by her hind legs because she had to come straight up and get her out. And thank goodness she was not full grown yet. But yeah, that was that was our goat uh, experience. One of the first ones with her. She was always intensely curious, and, and she did. She climbed in there to see what was going on. I guess. But she was always up to something with uh, her curiousness. And I also noticed that my goats over the the ones I had over the years, they would never touch anything that had uh, peppermint or spearmint on it, or any uh, areas of the yard that had it growing in it. Have you ever noticed that? No, that I haven't noticed. And I'm trying to because I, you know, have used essential oils with all of my animals, but um, I've never had a reason to use peppermint with her. So, and none of the treats that she gets have peppermint, so that's not something I've observed. But that's interesting. Yeah, I was just curious because I thought it was so strange because they would have nothing to do with anything peppermint had gotten onto. Well, and you know, it's interesting with animals how they 
um, and there's a, there's a good book out how they know what is good for them and what isn't, and there's a very good book out about this. It's called Wild Health. And, uh-huh. the, you know, the studies that they've done where they've observed animals in the wild, where monkeys have rolled up these leaves that have this real fibrous texture to them, and they roll them up in a very certain way and then swallow them. And what happened was then they found that the rolled leaves were coming out the other end and attached to it were parasites. So the monkeys were, you know, instinctively, I say this is, as, as opposed to sort of, you know, an intellectual thing. I think it's more instinctual. They know what to do to take care of their health. And that's true of horses. You know, they will go and eat herbs and uh, different types of greens that will help them. So it's really fascinating. That's kind of the, the, the philosophy behind the way I was trained to use essential oils is to always to offer the diluted oils to the animal and let them select. You know, of course, narrowing it down first to the ones we think are appropriate for what their imbalance is, but then offering it. And they're just, it's amazing how they know, you know, what their body needs or don't need. I wish you would explain that to Red. She has this insatiable sweet tooth. <laughs> and she will do anything for blueberries or pancake syrup. Well, she loves blueberries. Black. She has always loved for. blueberries. Pardon? What? She has always loved blueberries. She's yeah. nuts, absolutely nuts about blue, anything with blueberries in it. But she, yes, I think it was yesterday, just recently... We actually were teasing her with, with keywords because she wanted, we'd made pancakes, and she wanted the pancakes that were left on the plate. And she always eats the syrup first. She licks all the syrup off the plate, and then she eats the pancakes. And that's just her thing. I mean, she really loves pancake syrup. I don't know why. Well, Most dogs don't, don't care for sweets. <laughs> and a fair amount do. You know, it's, it's just kind of like with us. They can get accustomed to eating things that taste good to them but aren't necessarily good for them but still given the chance to you know take something that's going to help them they will and in the wild dogs will eat berries so oh yeah yeah i I did know that um red actually started life as a feral dog so she will kill and eat things um we have a peace treaty in effect on the house because cats you see resembles prey a great deal, uh-huh. and she knows she cannot eat them. <laughs> it's not allowed. Um, but she will go fishing. I've seen her fish many times. In fact, she would, when we lived in Arizona still, she would usually catch small catfish. We have these big spines on them, and I was always curious, how did she deal with the spines? And so when she would catch a fish, she would take the fish, and she would run off into the brush, and I'd be in hot pursuit because I wanted I didn't want the fish to take the fish away. I wanted to see how she ate the fish. Uh-huh. And I never got an opportunity. Um, when I would get there, you know, she was licking her lips and, and she was all done. There was no spines laying on the ground. There was nothing left. She ate the entire fish. And, you know, I, I still don't know how she coped with those spines. The only thing I can think of is that she bites them off and eats them first. That was yeah, the only thing I think. Yeah. yeah, that was because those spines are, are horrible. <laughs> Anybody who's gone fishing and caught catfish knows mm-hmm. how terrible those spines can be. And there wouldn't be anything left when she'd catch a fish. That was just her thing. She loves she still loves to go fishing, but in Louisiana I'm uh paranoid as when I everybody made jokes that when I moved here Red was going to get eaten by an alligator, and so I will not let her go swimming in waters that might potentially contain an alligator. A wise choice, I think. Yeah, yeah. Even though she's, everybody says, well, she's bigger than, you know, most alligators are going to eat, and I'm like, I don't want to take a risk. I don't even, you know, I had a nightmare once where she lost the leg to one, and that really made it, you know, I, I was firmly convinced she should not go swimming in alligator water. And then someone announced to me that sharks typically attack in less than two feet of water because we used to go to the beaches. Um, Harrison County, Mississippi is not far from New Orleans and it has dog-friendly beaches. And so we would go there or I'd go to Grand Isle, which is another dog-friendly beach. 
and uh, we would wade out in the water. Well, I'm not crazy. You know, I, I lived in the desert too many years. I'm not crazy about getting out very far. So about two feet was about as far as I was going to get into the water. After that, it's like, no, if it's more than six inches, uh, we're not going out there. <laughs> you know, with desert people, I guess we regard it as uh, sea monsters or something. I don't know. Everybody laughs at me, but, you know, that's okay. Well, we don't have any charts in Wisconsin either. Yeah, yeah, she always appreciates uh, when we take a trip someplace and uh, she gets to go swimming, uh, you know, like in Minnesota or, or there's actually a, a place we go in Florida, go camping, that the water's too cold, too fast for alligators, and she gets to go swimming there too. Well, she loves those those trips. And, uh, you know, anytime we get out of, out of the alligator area, she gets to go swimming and satisfy her fondness for water. But, you know, that's a trade-off, I guess. She's laying behind me right now. Um, you know, is the most common animal that you're consulted about dogs, or do people normally uh, call you about more exotic animals? Um, dogs, horses, cats are probably the most common with some birds in there, some rabbits, um, a few tortoises. Um, yeah, that's, you know, the tortoise is probably the most unusual. Reptiles so. don't make the list very often? Pardon? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Reptiles, you know, snakes and lizards and the like? No, uh-uh. I was just curious. Um, my daughter, as a, as a teenager, always wanted to have a pet snake, and I just never would let her. I said, snakes don't, you know, they're not pets. Um, they simply tolerate you. Uh-huh. And I said, we'll, we'll stick with, you know, domestic animals. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people do keep snakes. Very common pets. They do. As well as various kinds of lizards. And I, you know, I've not really spoken to a lizard or a snake. I have talked to bees. Um not for someone else, for myself, when I was having to paint a door in the middle of the hot afternoon, and there was a nest right above the door, and they were flying, buzzing around furiously, going in and out of their nest, and I'm not a real, I'm not real fond of bees, um, because I've been stung a few times, so I Uh told them that, listen, I'm going to paint the door here, and this is how it goes, you know? I'm not going to disturb you if you let me just quietly paint the door here. But if you buzz around, if you sing me, then I'm going to get out my big can of Raid and you're all going to die. And they were very, uh-huh. very quiet when I painted the door. <laughs> now, that might not seem like a very friendly thing to do, but it works. Yeah, you know, even though I'm not allergic to uh, wasp things, I have to admit... Um, that 30 seconds of, burn, of burning that I, I get from them, I'm not real thrilled with. And, you know, periodically, especially in Arizona more than here. Here I get mud doppers occasionally around the doors. But um, it was a, a wasp. It was typically called a yellow jacket, but it looks different than what they call a yellow jacket in the southeastern United States. It was a yellow wasp, probably two inches long, so it's a good-sized little bugger. <laughs> Yeah. And they loved a plant that I, we called Spanish broom that I had in my yard, as well as my patio. And the chickens, actually, when I had a few chickens, they would keep them out of the uh, Spanish broom because they devoured them with relish. Uh-huh. They really, really liked to eat them. <laughs> now, I did have a statement in the, or a question in the virtual auditorium and they were saying that it would be nice if uh, people could prove that telepathic communication was real and that it would change the way that we see the world. You know, is it possible, do you think, for anybody to prove whether or not it's real? Well, in our society, proving means going through some sort of scientific double-blind study type of thing. And so in that regard, it might be 
difficult. Um, I know when I started doing this, honestly, I was very skeptical. And it wasn't even when I was the one doing it. Um, and it took some, some really powerful things to happen that, you know, information that I got that I couldn't have known um, for me to really then begin believing it myself. But the whole notion of being able to um, send our energy elsewhere and know what's going on there, which can is telepathic, but it's also specifically known as remote viewing. Um, right. Right. Remote and we know the military explored that for a exactly. good period of time. Exactly. There's lots they of documentation about that. With, yeah, they used it with trained spies so that they could connect with a, a longitude and a latitude and know what was going on there. Uh, I was, my little remote viewing story, I was communicating with um, several animals. There was a couple that would call me occasionally and just have me check in with everybody. They had quite a few cats and dogs. And so I was on the phone with the wife, and I was, we had gone through, and I had communicated with each of the animals until we got to the new kitten that had just recently joined the family. And she wanted me to, you know, check in with the kitten. So I connected in with the little kitten. And I kept seeing just something flashing back and forth in front of my face, I mean, to the point that my head was going back and forth with it. And finally I said to her, I'm having trouble. Here's what's going on. And I explained to her what I was, you know, that something's going flashing back and forth in front of my face when I connect in with her. And the woman just started laughing. And it, as it turns out, while I was connecting in with the kitten and she was on the phone with me, her husband had a, one of those cat toys in his hand, a stick with a little furry thing on the end of it, and he was whipping it back and forth, and the kitten was playing with it. So I said, <laughs> stop, I'm getting dizzy. But it's that, you know, because when I connected in with the kitten, I saw what the kitten saw, and I even felt the head going back and forth and got kind of dizzy. So. so were you having your own dizzy experience, or was the cat dizzy, and you were feeling the cat's dizziness? I was feeling the cat's dizziness. Yeah. Um, but I, when I connect in with animals, I often um, am asked to, you know, to find out is there pain going on in the animal, how are they feeling, and not as a diagnostic way, but to, you know, just help them know what's going on or, or maybe what the level of pain is. And so when I connect in with their energy, it's as if I feel it in my own body. You know, as opposed to them telling me, oh, it hurts here, it hurts here, it hurts here, it hurts there. But I just feel it physically in my body. And so if I know that I'm connecting to a horse and I feel it in my right knee, I know it's their right cycle. And, you know, that, that's how that works. You know, I think for most people, all the tests in the world don't prove things one way or another. It's yes. when they exist experience um, someone using some form of uh, psychic uh, viewing or energy or whatever with them and does things or knows things that there is no way they could have guessed. And until that happens, um, they, they stay somewhat skeptical. I have to admit, I'm, I'm somewhat of a skeptic about a lot of different things. And last year on the program one time, I had a gentleman on who uh, did dousing for healing. And while we are on the program, he did a uh, dousing on me. With, he had a bullet on a chain is what he used. <laughs> and this, he's on the phone, West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, one of the states right there. I don't remember offhand where he was. And so he's, he's hundreds of miles away from me. And he does this thing with the chain about my allergy. Now, I have fairly severe food allergies. And you know that I've not had a food allergic reaction since then. And one of the things I'm allergic to is citrus. And that meant anything containing vitamin C, ascorbic acid, or citric acid, or natural flavorings, you, you know, it could be citrus-derived and had enough of whatever to cause a reaction in me. I've actually eaten food that contained lemon juice that I knew contained lemon juice, and nothing happened. You know, and so I have to say, 
that works. I've known, I've you know talked with psychics who knew things. They had no way of knowing um, things like I don't use my front door. I have furniture in front of it. There's no way that anybody would know that unless they had either been to my house or you know somebody who had had told them. There was no way for this person to have known that. Well, right. she knew that. So, you know, uh, maybe it's an individual sort of thing that, um, you know, people just have to experience it in order to understand it. Yes, and, well, I could go even, (laughs) I could get off on a tangent here about how we, you know, in my own personal belief that we create what shows up in our life. And I think that if you're determined that all of this is, not going to work, not going to work, then you're going to continue to pull experiences to you that prove that, you know. Um, So, and that's not to say, though, that we can't be surprised like you were with the dousing and the healing that came with that. Well, you know, I've experienced multiple healing sessions via distance, so there was no physical interaction uh, in in which... um, there was a noticeable change in the situation in a relatively short period of time that I couldn't attribute to anything else. One was the allergies. Another time I had a sinus infection. It was like Friday evening, which means it's going to be like probably Tuesday before I can see a a doctor. Anybody who's had severe sinus infections that come on suddenly knows that it feels like someone just took a hammer, a chisel, and and a sledgehammer and just smashed your face. This is you know, the pain can be intense, and I was in one of those types of situations. And two guys uh, cooperated and did this healing thing on me, and it went away. I didn't even have to see the doctor, which is unheard of for me. Um, you know, and, but a lot of people think that for anyone who uses um, psychic energy in any way, that it's their duty to prove it. Do you see it that way? No, no. Um, I, you know, if if people and I've had this just only two or three times where somebody has come to me and asked me because you know I can really sense that they're doubting and they need proof. And usually it's because they want to believe really badly, um, but they're very skeptical. Um, and so you know. One instance I remember is a man who was very sad because his dog had just tragically jumped off a roof and he felt sort of responsible for it. Um, And he came with his wife, and um, as I was connecting in with the dog that had crossed over, you know, he wanted to know I was really talking to his dog. And when he asked me, asked him what his favorite food is, and I got this squishy red stuff, and I said, it's like a tomato. And then he knew I was really talking to his dog, you know, (laughs) not something you would expect to be a dog's favorite food. Right, right. And they can have weird favorite foods sometimes. Pardon? They can have very weird favorite foods sometimes. But but he needed that because he needed to understand that I really was talking to the dog that passed over. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are a lot of other people out there that are very skeptical and want to test, but... My intention is that they don't come to me, and they don't. I just put it out there. You know, I just want the people to come to me that are ready for this. Right, right. And and I completely understand that. You know, sometimes um, I guess I just, I can totally understand and even agree with the stances. I don't need to prove anything. You can believe or not believe, and I really don't care which one you do. Right. You know, and, and that that. It's very understandable. Yeah. I recently, um, um, I recently talked at a high school. Um, there's a high school, a rural high school, where the agriculture teacher is um, very open-minded, and she invited me to talk to her veterinary science class. So these are like seniors in high school. And I always, and I started out by asking, you know, how many here believe we can communicate telepathically with animals and you know it in your soul? and two or three people raised their hands. And how many of you think it might be possible, but you're skeptical and you need it proven to you? 
and a few more people, you know, have, you know, half a dozen raised their hands. And then how many think this is a crock? That was the rest of the class. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So worked yeah. out for me. But, you know, after I talked a little bit, they started really listening when they started hearing some of the stories and some of the research, you know, about, like, the government using remote viewing. So there are definitely skeptics out there, but you're right. You can't, you know, if they're ready for it, fine. If they're not, you plan to feed and move on. Well, you know, I guess it's, I regard it sort of as a tool. You know, and I have many tools in my toolbox. And not all tools are necessarily what I'm going to choose for all situations. Um, for Red's inability to resist getting in the trash, I would probably never consult an animal psychic about it because I know why she gets in the trash. She's bored and it smells interesting and she's investigating. There's also occasions when it's uh, a vindictive or uh, somewhat like revenge. Uh, she got caught one time because I, I used to make this joke. I swear, I would say, I swear she grabs the coffee filters and dumps the trash and gets the coffee filters and shakes it so that it spatters everywhere. <laughs> but one day I had gone out to the truck and I, you know, maybe I'd moved a few feet or, or just had gone and gotten something. I don't remember, but I came right back in the house. And when I did, I caught her standing in the kitchen with the coffee filter in her teeth. And it was like, I knew you were doing that. There was no other explanation. She didn't like coffee. Um, she was doing it because she knew it really made me unhappy. And I was making her unhappy because I made her stay home alone. So she was expressing herself, I guess. That's right. She doesn't do that anymore, thank goodness. But she will get in the trash. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's... You know, it's just one of those things that she does. I know if I don't put up the trash, she's going to get in it. Um, it's it happens fairly often. Uh, I guess she gets the trash two or three times a month because I forget. After all these years, I still forget. Um, but at the same time, you know, I did uh, consult uh, a, an animal communicator about the problem I had between my two dogs, and you know, then my choice was. You know, either one went to live someplace else or I live like I do now where the two dogs are simply never in the same space together. And um, that was what I decided on because I couldn't find a solution. I consulted trainers. I consulted, you know, all sorts of people because I couldn't figure out why it was going on. And, you know, everybody sort of came to the same conclusion. The two dogs are never going to get along. And and they did for two years. And then the, the problem started. Um, my smaller dog wants to become the dominant dog and, and the bigger one's not going to give in. And it's, it, it cost me quite a bit in an emergency clinic last year when, you know, the confrontation resulted in the little one getting hurt. So that was just, you know, one of those things that there was no easy solution to. And sometimes that happens, I think. Yeah. And now, Angelica, there. you're sitting over there being rather quiet this evening. Yes. <laughs> I'm enjoying both of your stories. <laughs> oh, well, I see, I've worked with animals, mostly dogs, uh, oh. some with cattle and horses my entire life. So dog stories I have a gazillion of. Um, cat stories I have a few. Uh, you know, cats can be quite amusing. I have two very different cats. One's very fat and one's very skinny. I call him Jack Spratt and his wife. <laughs> but that's not really their names. Uh, my Tom Cat is fully well, neutered, but he's as skinny as they come. He's a long, skinny cat. And then uh, poor Callie looks like a calico covered bowling ball. <laughs> yeah, they're very, very different personalities. And, you know, they're very, they're much, very much a valued part of my life. I've often, you know, had friends, and even when I was single and dating, you know, you, you get in a relationship and someone doesn't like the animals. And, you know, maybe I was different because my response was, they were here before you were, and they're going to be here when you're gone. Um, 
they were much more valuable to me than the relationship was. Uh, but for many people, that becomes a huge conflict. Do you ever get calls about situations like that? Um, not quite that, but I. But there have been a few situations where the dog is, um, you know, very attached to the wife and growls at the husband. <laughs> Uh-huh. Um, you know, and and sometimes it's the communication that's needed, and sometimes, honestly, they need to do some behavior things, you know. I mean, the animals, right. um, they came here to experience being a dog or being a cat or being a horse. So I think we really need to respect that instinctual nature that they wanted to experience. So, And uh-huh. me personally, yeah, I wouldn't have somebody in my life if they didn't. You know, also love animals. Yeah, you know, I have to admit, Red was my litmus test when I was dating, and she was quite inventive at voicing her opinions about people. I think the worst one was um, a guy I was dating, and he got too close to me to suit her, and she stood up on her hind legs and rammed him with her front legs and knocked him back about eight feet into the wall. And he was obviously a rocket scientist because he stands up afterwards and he says, did she do that on purpose? I'm thinking, oh, boy, (laughs) because I knew what she was doing. She was saying, back off. She did not like it. And uh, so he stepped up beside me again, and she repeated it. And she did. She knocked him back about eight feet. Or she would do things. She knew that growling was not an acceptable thing. solution, she would sit and, like, if I'd go get coffee or something, uh, she would sit where the person could hear her, and I couldn't, and she would growl very softly. And I knew something was up when she'd sit in there, was very innocent, and the person is sitting on the sofa or the chair or whatever, frozen in absolute terror. Um, because she, she would. She would do these sort of things. Um to intimidate them and make them want to go away. And, you know, I have to admit, I found it somewhat amusing. And I learned over time, I, she was a way better judge of character than I was. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and because they they live from their ability to read energy, they really can do a better job than us sometimes. Yeah, you know, I have to admit, um, she absolutely loves my partner, so, you know, life is is great. One uh, finally passed the test. Yeah, yeah, and she loved him right from the beginning. And I've I've seen people bribe her. I've seen, you know, all sorts of um, efforts to win her over. And it really, with her, it boiled down to she either liked him or disliked him right from the get-go. Now, she is uh, a... uh, going to go ahead and take the bribery. All right, don't get me wrong. <laughs> she loves food. Um, you offer her a sausage or a Big Mac or whatever, oh, yeah, she's going to take it. But as soon as it's gone, so is the um, affection. Yeah, uh, she either likes or dislikes people for right from the beginning. Um, and I've had you know, animals and, tell me, too, when um, the person's communicating, it may not be something that they've asked about, but if the person is dating somebody that they don't approve of, they'll, they'll tell. They'll say so. Hmm. Which could be hard for the Yeah, um, I find cats interesting. They often watch things I can't see. So, uh, I, I have to admit, I wonder what they're seeing. Well, animals see spirits often. Yes. So that could very well be. Yeah. Um, I actually have another story with, with Red, and, and it, I you know I don't know what came in the house that day, but it's the reason why I don't use my front door. Um, at that time, her bed was by the front door, and I had a foster dog that did not get along with her. It was an older dog, and this particular dog and, and her just were not getting along. And I ultimately traded her out for another one of the, the youngsters that I normally had. And the Dalmatian, which it was a Dalmatian, was in a, in a crate in the, in, a, in the center of the house, practically. So, you know, about 10, 12 feet away from that front door. 
because I have a little house. And both dogs were asleep. Uh, the dog was, the, the Dalmatian was asleep in, her, in the crate on her bed, and Red had her bed over by the door. And I was doing something, so I happened to be walking past the Dalmatian, and all of a sudden, Red jumped up and spun around facing the door, and she's growling and snarling. And I'm looking because I don't see anything. The door's locked, okay, you know, what's going on? And um, she's backing away and continues with the snarling, and she's obviously terrified at the same time. I have never seen this dog terrified before. And when she gets about maybe three feet away from me, she's crouched down. She's not responding to me at all. She's totally fixated on watching whatever it was came through the front door, floated um, down uh, towards the hallway, up towards the ceiling, and then reversed and went out the front door. And the whole process took maybe two minutes. It seemed like 20, but two, probably two minutes. <clears throat> and she watched it, tracked it with her eyes. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, she's not responding to me at all. Nothing I say to her. She's not turning around looking at me, nothing. But as it approached the furthest point from the door, and she's snarling and growling in, in a semi-crouched, or I'm fixing to attack position, her bladder let loose in a fear response. Now, I'd heard of this, but I'd never seen this. But a 70-pound dog, when their bladder lets loose, and they don't uh, squat or anything, it just dumps. That's a lot of urine. <laughs> a lot. And it's all over the floor. This dog would never dream of making a mess in the house. I mean, she wouldn't do it. And uh, then it went out, and as soon as it exited the house, she turned around and responded to me and looked at the puddle of urine like, where does that come from? <laughs> you know? And, you know, thank goodness I have tile floors, so the mess gets cleaned up. I had to move her bed. She would not go over there. And so, to this day, I have a small, like, coffee table in front of the door. And I periodically had trouble with the door unlocking itself. I don't know how. Um, but it gets unlocked. Obviously, nobody goes out with that table there. And that's my spook story with Red Dog. And uh, I don't know what she saw. I never saw a thing. I never felt a thing other than the hair standing up on the back of my neck because the dog was so terrified. Yeah. And that... They they do, you know, they really do see and sense those energies, and sometimes they're really freaked out by them. And I, I think it depends on, you know, what the energy is coming from, too, as to whether or not they're comfortable with it or not. Right, right. And, you know, uh, she's she scared me before. I remember a camping trip where I spent the night terrified, certain I'm about to be eaten by some large predator like a bear. And when the sun came up the next morning, um, after I spent a cold, miserable night without dinner because I was afraid to, of attracting predators, the um, sun comes up and I discover that I've just spent this miserable night uh, anxiously listening for the sound of an approaching marauding bear over a two-inch finch in a bush. <laughs> yeah, Red's little quirk is she absolutely hates birds. And uh, I informed her that I was not real happy about this false alarm that had gone on for so long. Uh, she's never done it to me again, but uh, it, it was a long, and it was cold, it was miserable. I was camping like in early November and I was high in the in the mountains in New Mexico and you know I'd hurriedly set up the tent I skipped having any hot drink or, or supper or anything because she kept saying there's something coming up that ravine after us and uh, it's yeah it's the only really major false alarm she's ever given me but oh I was not happy because <laughs> it was it was a very miserable night yeah. So, you know, they do have personalities. Like I said, you know, she hates birds. <laughs> Most dogs don't care about birds. No. <laughs> um, I had a cats? bird one time that uh, huh? told me it was afraid of mice. And I thought that was the most bizarre thing I'd ever heard. And so, you know, I was almost afraid to tell the client that, you know? <laughs> uh-huh. But when I told the client, she was like, Oh, well, that makes sense, because 
when we go up north and we took her with it, you know, we take her with us. One time, there the mice got into the bottom of her cage. <laughs> like, all right, you just never know what you're going to hear. Yeah, you know, I've often thought because in read the litter there was only herself and she had a brother, and I've often thought, well, maybe one of the pups, one or more of the pups, was taken by hawks, eagles, or whatever, and that's where her fear of birds came from. Um, because that's a logical explanation in her case, because yeah. she's always had it. And the area they were they were being raised in, they were being raised in a culvert. The mother was a dog that had been dumped. And uh, that's that's a very possible scenario. Yep. And she, like I said, she she really hates birds. I used to raise um, cage birds. I would never dream of have, bringing a bird to the house as long as Red's alive. Simply because of how much she dislikes them. I mean, they're even worse than cats. <laughs> she don't like cats either. So okay, well, you, ladies, it is time for a break. So, uh, stay tuned and check out our website at www.exogenynetwork.com while we're gone. And the Donna Shades will return with our guest, Wendy Wolf, and our guest co-host, Angelica Del Mar. Welcome back to the Donna Shays. I'm your host, Gia Scott, and we also have our guest co-host, Angelica Del Mar, and our guest, Wendy Wolf. I would like ever to remind everybody to visit the website, www.exogenynetwork.com. Sign up for the newsletter, wander around, explore the website. There are links there to take you to blogs, Twitter, and even Facebook. If you have a question that you wish to, to ask us, you can email it to me at gscott at gmail.com. I am monitoring the email during the program with Wendy Wolf tonight. And if you're in the virtual auditorium, you can send it via text. I'll watch that as well. Now, um, before we uh, get going too far uh, into the topics that we're going to explore in the second half of the program, um, Wendy, would you go ahead and give your website again? Sure, it's wendywolf.com, and that uh, wolf is W-O-L-F-E, so it's wendywolfe.com. Okay. Now, while we were on break, we were uh, talking like, you know, I tend to do, and and I'm sure everybody else tends to do. Um, And, you know, some of the things that, or one of the things that came up was reincarnation in regards to pets. And, Wendy, I guess you got story to tell us. I do, and, and it's a very personal story. Um, it's about one of my dogs who, um, when he was about 11 years old, his name was Tiger, he was a Lhasa Maltese cross, and he, when he was about 11, he cracked his tooth. And so it was going to require him going in and having the tooth extracted, and it was causing him discomfort. And this was at a time when I was doing communicating, so... Uh, professionally, so when he went in, the, you know, in the morning, I dropped him off early, and then when I sat down to do my meditation, and then I had some clients lined up, I decided to connect in with him first, and I had already told him that, you know, what was going to happen, he was going to go in, and they would do the surgery, but the pain from the tooth would be gone, and I connected in with him, and I connected in while he was in surgery, and I could see that he had actually left his body he was as they say going to the light and Uh I was extremely distressed by this because at the time he was the only dog I had and he was uh, my very very close soul dog and Uh so I begged him I said please don't leave please 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 don't leave you're my best man in the whole world please don't leave and he went back into his body and I quickly forgot about it and went on to do the rest of my communications and uh, a little while later, the vet called and said, 
everything went fine, and you can come pick him up later. So I went and picked him up later, and he looked fine at the vet, and we got home, but as he was walking up the deck, he let out a little yelp. And I, you know, kind of checked in with him, and I'm like, something's not right, something's, you know, not right, and I called the vet. Um, at about 6 o'clock, so, you know, they were closed, and I got the vet that was on call, and she said, well, he's older now, you know, it could just be, you know, it's taking him longer to come out of the anesthesia, and I'm thinking, no, I don't think so, but, you know, I went ahead and said, okay, and I, but I kept a real close eye on him, and about an hour or so later, I noticed that he was not waiting his left leg, and when I went and looked closely at it, the whole leg was swollen. And now it's something you kind of need to understand, too, that when it gets this emotional, it can be a little more difficult to get the clear information when it's your own animal and somebody you love right. dearly. Mm-hmm. So I called the vet again and rushed him back there, and she looked around, you know, she was not the vet that had done the surgery on him that day, and so she was looking for his file to see what was put in that leg, and she could not find his file. It was missing. So she thought, well, he's having an allergic reaction. She said, I'm going to give him this injection. He should be 50% better by morning. And we set up an early morning appointment for me to bring him back in. So the next morning, I took him back in, but he had not improved at all. And um, they gave him some other injections. And at one point, I stopped a few of them because this was a dog that um, didn't do well with drugs anyway, and that's a whole other story about vaccinosis and over-vaccination. But, you know, I knew what, is, you know, what he could tolerate, and I said, you know, let's give him a pain and let's skip some of these others. And what we found out, too, when I took him back that morning, because then he saw the vet that he had seen originally, was that the only thing that had gone into that leg was saline solution. Uh-huh. So um, I took him back home, and they, you know, wanted me to observe him, and it was a very, very difficult day. I watched him get worse. I watched him leave his body. You know, I was going to take him to another clinic um, about an hour or two away, but I knew he didn't want me to do that, and that was just the hardest thing, not, you know, because that's just that sort of that that intuitive thing that did come through to me is, no, nothing else is going to work here. And I used my essential oils. I used some helichrysium because at one point he got really uncomfortable. And I used some helichrysium and that helped. And then he relaxed. But I could, I could actually see him leave his body and then go back in again. Um, and then that night at about 10 o'clock, my, uh, one of the other dogs that was here, was, belonged to my partner, she started growling and woke us up. And Tiger was taking his last breath. So... Um, I, you know, and I tried to do all those things you do. I tried to give him CPR and all of that, but it didn't work. And I held him in my arms, and as he passed, I could still feel his spirit with me. And so even though it was extremely difficult, I felt his spirit with me. And that was comforting. So I held him for a few hours, and then we decided that, um, that we would bury him that night, even though it was, you know, actually the morning by then and it was a beautiful clear night and the big sun or the big moon out and we took him out and put him into um, a a grave that my partner had dug and put in his little jacket that said run hard bark loud Um, Uh and some some other things with him some special stones and some feathers and things Um, and as I'm kneeling there and crying, the, um, a pack of coyotes just sort of, it's like they heard me and they started howling with me. And then an owl started. And so there's this, you know, really difficult, heart, heart-wrenching thing going on. And yet there's this beauty that I can't even explain. And I still feel his spirit with me. Uh-huh. Um, and something said to me, what, check the date, check the date. So the next day, I looked at what the date was, and if you remember, it was really his intention to leave that first day when he was in surgery, and that was um, June 21, 2004, and that was exactly 11 years to the date that he had come into my life when I looked back into his file. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah, and so he, you know, he wanted me to know, and, and in later communications with him, you know, he let me know that there wasn't anything else that I could have done, that that was his time to go, and that was his intention. And so um, even a couple of weeks after that, um, I was at a, at a health fair, and there was somebody doing oral photography, and I'd never experienced that before. So I thought, oh, this will be really cool. So she took a photograph of my aura, which, you know, for those of you, if you've not experienced it, it's basically a picture of your energy field, and they can tell things by the different colors that are there. And the woman, as she's looking at it, she's explaining to me what the different colors mean, and she looks, and she doesn't know me, and I, she doesn't know anything about me or my life. And she looks at it, and she says, well, this is interesting. There's another spirit here attached to you. It's a small spirit. And tears just started running down my eyes. I said, yep, that's Tiger. That's my dog who recently passed. And so now I, I just I still have this Polaroid photograph of my aura, and um, and I have Tiger's you know energy field enmeshed in it that I can see. Uh, so about um, seven months later, I'm doing I'm teaching an animal communication class, and during the classes I do meditations where I have them connect with their animals, and as I'm doing that I take a moment, they're all connecting, so I just kind of will sometimes just ask my animals, is there anybody who needs anything? And Tiger popped in, and he said, I'm coming back. And I said, what? He says, I'm coming back. And I was just, and he said, soon. And I was just really ecstatic. I mean, I, it really hadn't, even though I've helped a lot of clients with this sort of thing, it really hadn't occurred to me that that, that would happen or that quickly anyway. And so I just knew then, I thought, well, it's great. He's coming back, and when he comes back, I'll know. It'll be really clear to me. Um, and at the time, I think I had, had a trip planned out to California, and when I got back and I'm checking my email, I saw an email from somebody who uh, my partner had gotten a dog from, and it said puppy. And I was kind of surprised by that because she had a male and female toy poodle and she hadn't, um, she'd had one or two litters was all and then she was going to get them both spayed and neutered. And so I was really surprised because the last time I'd heard from her, that was the plan and they were to be fixed. Well, as the story goes, the female had, was scheduled to be spayed in a week and the male had not been, um, or, or this is what she told me, um, that the male had been neutered, but the female had not been spayed, but she was scheduled to be spayed when she got a call from a woman who desperately wanted to have a litter from the female. And she said, but I've already got the male neutered. And she said, well, that doesn't matter because the male that I want you to breed with him, her, I want you to breed with a Maltese. And when I read that and found, realized that this was going to be a multi poo and I had asked Tiger that when he came back that he'd be small and cute like he was before. Uh -huh. And I realized then he was coming back in this litter. Um, and I called a friend and got <laughs> and a mentor and, and got some help with that, some confirmation. But sure enough, um, eight weeks later, um, or from, I was able to meet Tiger, who had come back now as a multi poo and uh -huh. when I looked at the, the email to find out when the puppies were born, he left me the date. He came back exactly eight months to the day that he left. He came back on the same day. So, um, and now he's been with me for like five years. Uh -huh. You know, that's interesting yeah, because, you know, even for people who are very dog-oriented, there comes usually saying is once in a lifetime. Now, I've been fortunate enough I've had more than one of those once in a lifetime dogs. Uh -huh. And Red is one of those once in a lifetime dogs. Um, you know, she's, you know, I have an exceptionally close relationship with her. Um, in some ways, I'm excessively dependent on her, which, you know, a lot of people don't realize how dependent you can be on feedback that you get from your dog. Um, I, uh, when I got red, I was grieving for my son. He uh, had died a year before, or about a year before, a year and a half 
before. And, you know, I'd, I'd been going through a lot. Anybody who's lost a child knows that's a very difficult thing. And so I was, you know, having all those issues. I was getting divorced. And I get a phone call from a friend. I had been looking for a large dog. I wanted what is referred to as a, as a bear dog. It's not hunt bear, but rather they just make a lot of racket and make the bear want to go elsewhere. Because I spent a lot of time hiking and camping in very remote areas. And so I, I told people, well, I'm looking for one, and I wanted a female. And, you know, I, I get a phone call at that from this, this friend, and he says, I caught those puppies I've been telling you about. Well, he'd been telling me that he'd found a litter of, of feral puppies, and he'd been feeding them and trying to get close enough to catch them. And anybody who's, who's dealt with feral dogs knows when they get ser- are so big, um, they're frequently shot because feral dog packs can be potentially dangerous. And in rural communities, um, they are regarded as, as a real danger. And uh, he said he caught the two puppies. And they were, you know, both females. And I said, okay, well, you know, I'll be coming into town, you know, later this afternoon and I'll stop by then. Well, you know, to make a long story short, um, the first puppy they pulled out was this red puppy with a black face. And, I mean, they smell bad. They're obviously wormy. They're, they're suffering from malnutrition. Um, you know, there's everything wrong. I'd, I'd work mostly with purebred dogs. So I'm looking at this dog and I'm thinking, sure, you're ever loving mine. And this dog is so mean and foul-tempered. This puppy is. And... The second puppy was a wolf gray puppy with a black face, identical to the first one except it was wolf gray instead of uh, red. But it wasn't nearly as, as mean. And I said, <laughs> red one's too mean. Give me the, the gray one. And so we're sitting around, and, and when the puppy finally quits peeing on me because they were terrified, they peed all over me, I roll it over and I look and I said, Dave, which happened to be the name of the friend, I said, you need to go back to school. And she says, what are you talking about? I said, this is not a girl. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I didn't know. And I said, then why did you tell me they were both girls? And, you know, he just shrugged. I guess he just wanted me to come look at the puppy. And his daughter was holding this vicious red puppy. And I asked her to hold up the puppy so I could see if it was a male or a female. And the other one was a female. So I said, okay, uh, let's trade puppies. And uh, to make a long story short, Red has been with me for over eight years now. And, you know, she uh, she goes with me camping and hiking. Um, the standing joke was always if a bear ever, you know, attacked us in camp, I would probably get killed saving the dog. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> she saved me from uh, numerous incidences where... You know, someone was potentially threatening, um, you know, gangs of uh, older adolescent boys, you know, and, and, and you know, on dark streets and whatnot. And she'd pop out and do what we got called the Colgate smile, and they suddenly found a reason to be elsewhere. Um, you know, she's terrified every uh, potential little um, hoodlum in the neighborhood because they saw her go over a fence once and, and now they're convinced that she you know, is like super dog, she can like eight foot fences in a single pound and rip off limbs with, you know, without blinking an eye. And, you know, that illusion just suits me fine because I really don't want to deal with assholes. But she has, you know, she's traveled all over with me, she's been camping all over with me and I depend on her to pay attention around me so I don't have to. And it allows me to relax more and so forth and so on. And, you know, the, the thought of her aging, because this winter she started to show major aging signs. Uh, she's been very, very stiff a lot of times and obviously not feeling good and limping and whatnot. And it's just arthritis and age catching up with her. And so I'm looking at, you know, uh, sometime in, she, as a large dog, I probably have, four to six years of her being a good part of my life. Um, maybe less, maybe more. But, you know, average four to six years is all I have left now. And that's a tough 
scenario to be looking at. And so to hear your story about uh, your tiger is um, heartwarming, I guess you might say, and reassuring. And I've helped a lot of people be reunited with their animals, and I, and I don't believe that it's... Um, it's a difficult. It, I guess what I'm saying is, if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. People right. Sometimes right. Afraid, you well, know, I don't like why. Pardon? I said I don't know why I have such an intense bond with uh, Red because you know, like I said, I'm a dog person. I've spent a lifetime working with dogs. I've had, you know, over the years, I've had a number of, of what I would call a personal dog, and, and that's a dog that you have a real personal relationship with um, when you're working with them you know, in terms of uh, a professional relationship, a lot of times they are like livestock and you don't get your personal with them. Uh, they may only be in your life for a few years and then they, you know, go to somebody else. And it's a different sort of relationship. A lot of people don't realize that that, that type of relationship often exists, but it does. It does. And, you know, with Red, it's it's way beyond any personal relationship I've ever had with a dog. And it's, it is. It's very, very intense. Um, I have seen her literally leap over sofas because she did not want other people between her and I. I mean, she can be, real, she, she can be as bad as I am. Um, and we do have an exceptionally close relationship. I don't like to... Um, go to sleep without her in the house um, I'm uneasy you know and so forth and so on she's alleviated a lot of symptoms like you know the, the insomnia and whatnot. and I've had insomnia my whole life um, part of it was caused by nightmares well she started where if I was starting to have a nightmare she'd wake me up she'd stick her cold nose in my neck and she did and over a period of time where you couldn't have the nightmare your fear of going to sleep went away so she's, she's been important for that. In addition, uh, the inability to wake up is a byproduct of, of not going to sleep. And uh, I've been given a new alarm. It's called Screaming Me. And it goes off at 120 decibels, which is incredibly loud. And even as loud as that was, I would sometimes be in such a deep sleep that it wouldn't immediately wake me up. But, and I'm still not sure if it was the alarm that actually woke me up or the fact that Red would go airborne when it went off because it was, it's literally that loud. I don't have one right now because my partner has threatened, threatened uh, smashing if another one comes in the house because they are so incredibly loud. And, you know, that, that, that type of relationship is probably a once-in-a-lifetime. I also had a boxer and a Labrador, and they were... Oh, the boxer was over 20 years ago, and the Labrador is probably over 30 years ago now. Um, so, you know, I haven't had a lot of the really close relationships. But I, I think my experience with dogs is kind of typical, that uh, you don't always have that super special one. Yes, I, yeah, I would agree with that. That I mean, there are a lot that we can love and care for, but then there are some that just really, really hook in with us, and I think that's because that's another soul that we've spent a lot of previous lifetimes with. Yeah, even when, if, if even if Red was a dog in our previous lifetimes, I, I really do feel like she has been with me on many journeys, mm -hmm. and that she has, you know, always been, you know, somewhat my guardian. Um, she came into my life in a very unique way at a very low point. Um, and, you know, uh, she is, she is truly special to me. Now, not to say that I love Sissy any less, because I don't. Um, obviously, you know, I go through this elaborate ritual of keeping the two dogs separated. Uh, Red often wears a muzzle just in case Sissy gets loose. And, you know, when we go camping and whatnot, just in case Sissy gets loose and, and manages to get to her, because Sissy will jump her, and that starts the problem. Right. And uh, if Red cannot retaliate, then uh, Sis can't hurt her. I mean, between Red's coat and uh, saggy, baggy skin, their skin's like four sizes too big. 
she can't sissy can't hurt her. Uh, she might make her, you know, get a little nick here, but she's not going to hurt her uh, because of the size difference. Sissy only weighs 25 pounds, so she's not a big dog. Um, so the muzzle is, a lot of people think it's because Red's vicious. No, it's because <laughs> Red will retaliate, and you can't blame her for that. So, you know, another part of what you do is aromatherapy. And aromatherapy is something that, you know, I really don't have a great understanding of it. I understand that scents can shift your moods. They can uh, do that sort of thing, uh, make you feel energetic, make you feel calmer. But I don't have a great understanding of it, and I don't think I'm alone in that. How do you reuse aromatherapy with dogs and cats and other pets? Um, well, with... I use them in a couple of ways, um, using them for those calming effects or grounding effects is one, and that's sort of using it on an energetic level, although it does have a physical component because essential oils are very volatile, meaning that they're, um, the molecules travel quickly into the air, and when they're inhaled, and they only need to be inhaled to have an effect, they go through... Um, the nasal passages and go right to the limbic portion of the brain and actually affect the way the, the chemicals that are being sent out of the brain and that's why they can have that calming effect for animals or for people. They can have energizing effects. Um, but they also have a lot of other properties that are really important. They can be very antibacterial and highly antiviral, um, anti-inflammatory, um, antihistamine properties to them too. So they can be used for a variety of things. Um, but one thing that I would say right off the bat is when you're working with cats, you have to be extremely careful. Cats don't metabolize the essential oils, even if they're inhaled the way other uh -huh. animals do, and some are um, it's, and some specific oils that this is true of. So they can have difficulty, and they can even get toxic and die from if you don't know what you're doing with cats. So I always say if you're not working with a trained, you know, animal aromatherapist, then use... Well, you know, I know that even I make soap, and um, when I'm using essential oils in soap, there are certain essential oils that you don't use in soaps that are going to be used by people with certain conditions, like pregnancy or high right. blood pressure. Uh -huh. And so, you know, they have a physical effect yeah. that is known. I mean, you, you know, as, as a soap maker, I could look up. Uh, sometimes it tend to be drying to the skin and so forth and so on. So, you know, I know of physical properties in regards to it, and I would choose the essential oils largely for their scents. Mm -hmm. But obviously I wasn't going to use rosemary if I was going to give it to somebody who was expecting a baby. Exactly. <laughs> right. And those are the kinds of things you know. The other thing with animals is their sense of smell is so much stronger than ours that it's really important to dilute the essential oils. And, you know, because if you think about it... Um, I know when I first was introduced to essential oils and I did not have the training, there were people who were talking about, well, just put these drops of oil on your dog's paw, you know, not with, first without diluting them, second without asking the animal's permission. And I'm not even talking about as an animal communicator, but allowing the dog to sniff it and say, you know, show a reaction to it, like this is something I want or this is something I don't want. And uh -huh. so when I did get the training, um, I, I learned to use the oils. I learned how to dilute them and how to offer them. And it's, it's fascinating, and this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, animals knowing what they need. It's fascinating to see them react to the oil, and they may just want to inhale it. They may want to lick it from your hand, and that's safe with the oils that I use, you know, a therapeutic-grade oil in a, um, in a base oil that's something that they can ingest. And so they might want to lick it from your hand. Sometimes they'll want it rubbed on you. Um, and the other piece of it, it gets a little more complicated with the way that I approach it, is that first I use muscle testing to determine what meridians are out of balance in the animal. And then uh -huh. um, when I know what meridians are out of balance, so I'm sort of getting to the core issue of the animal's problem, then I select essential oils based on that, and then I test again with the muscles to make sure that I have the most um, effective oils to help them. 
and then okay. I offer the oils. And um, I was working with my horse, Smokey, and actually this was with students that were here learning this a few years ago. And they had done the testing, and his gallbladder meridian was one of the problems. And so they are out, we're out in the barn, and we're offering the oils. So we're just holding the bottle open at first and letting him sniff it. And then we put a few drops in our hand and let him sniff it from there. And he kept swinging his head around and, you know, hitting back on his side. And the, the young woman who was doing this wasn't quite clear what he was doing. And I finally said, he's trying to tell you something. I said, look at where he's pointing with his nose. And he was pointing to a spot on himself that was one of the gallbladder meridian points, acupuncture points. So he was wanting her to rub that oil, which was for the gallbladder meridian, on this point, and he was pointing directly to it. And I've had horses do that um, with other points, too. That's how oh. amazing it is that they that they have this instinct that tells them that's what they need and that's where they need it put on. But I've, I've had it used, you know, I've used it for hot spots. Um, I've used it for fears, dogs that are afraid of thunderstorms. Frankincense uh -huh. works really well for that. Um, and to help a dog focus for an agility trial or herding, you know, something like that I've used it for and, and had really good success. You know, one thing that uh, Red used to be absolutely terrified of fireworks and gunshots and the like. And um, moving to New Orleans, you know, first of all, was a huge change uh, at first she was very, very uncomfortable because walking down the street, she felt very exposed because in a lot of ways she had very wolf-like behavior that even though we'd been living together so long at that point, it was about 18 months I'd had her before we moved here, um, a lot of the wolf-like behavior still existed. And she didn't like walking down the street and being exposed. She had a very hard time learning that that was okay. I mean, now when if I, I take her to PetSmart or... or wherever, patio, you know, to have coffee or, or whatever, nobody would ever know that she didn't used to act like this. As she's wearing her pink t-shirt, looks totally ridiculous and thinks she's beautiful. Um, but the fireworks is very, very common here. And I happen to live near a baseball stadium that shoots off fireworks during home game, after home games. So fireworks in the summertime happen to me two, three times a month in addition to um, New Year's and, and Fourth of July. So the frequent fireworks, she was she hated it. But along comes New Year's Eve, and there's a lot of fireworks going off all over the city. It surrounds us. The air actually gets smoky from the amount of fireworks being shot off. And I'm standing on the porch with some friends watching the fireworks, and she had to choose. I had the door open. She could stay in the house or she could come out with me. It was up to her. And she she went back and forth, back and forth, and finally she decided it was better to be outside with me than it was, you know, with the scary fireworks than it was to be in the house alone. And now, when the fireworks start, if I don't get her out the door, she's just about beside herself. She wants to go out and watch. <laughs> now, my other dog, fireworks and gunshots, Sissy is absolutely terrified. She wants in her crate uh, or under furniture. I mean, uh -huh. that's just it. That's the only two places she wants to be when this is going off. She has never gotten any better. Uh, she she gets it just as often as Red, and I've had her sissy now six years, I think. Um, so, you know, five or six years. So, you know, I've had her quite a while, and, you know, there's been no change. You know, is aromatherapy something that I could use to help soothe her anxiety? Yes, I would take some frankincense and therapeutic grade, you know, um, uh -huh. and I would dilute it in a base oil. And by a base oil, it can be like an almond oil, um, safflower, or sunflower oil. I recommend organic. It can even be olive oil. Oh, okay. soap making is typically olive oil is what I will use as a yep. carrier oil. So, and, that, and that's fine as a carrier. So, you know... You want about one or two drops of the frankincense in about five mils or about a tablespoon of carrier oil. Uh -huh. And so what you can do is you can even, you know, put a few drops of that on a little piece of cloth and put it in her crate. 
Let her sniff it first, make sure she doesn't have an aversion to it. I, I've never had a dog have an aversion to frankincense, but I would offer it first. And if she seems okay with it, then I would leave it in her crate. Uh-huh. And, I you might, know, I if you know that fireworks are coming that night, you know, give her a little time to relax ahead of time. So maybe, you know, offer it to her a half hour before the fireworks she start. She knows, I, you know, I call it the sissyometer because she knows hours before a thunderstorm arrives. Yes. I mean, we'll have clear skies in the morning, and she's already hiding under the furniture. Right. And... The, and, and it's that has to do with the change of the barometric pressure. Uh huh. The, the dogs and the horses, they feel it. And for some of the dogs, the way that that feels on their energy field just freaks them out. I mean, I've, I've had Here's a question this for you. What? I, I have a question for you. On uh, several occasions, you know, uh, I've been sitting, you know, doing whatever during a thunderstorm, and Red's been sitting there with me. But I have noticed on some occasions she jumps before the clap of thunder. Now, she's not afraid of it, but she's like everybody else. A loud noise will make her jump. Mm-hmm. She'll jump before the noise happens. You know, uh, She jumps before you hear it. Right. <laughs> Remember, her hearing is much better than yours. <laughs> oh, she because it, it'll startle me because, you know, she, first of all, she's jumping, and then this incredibly loud crack of thunder will follow, mm-hmm. uh, like it's right overhead. And I was always wondering, why does she jump before the sound? Mm-hmm. Well, well I'm sure she it. feels it, too. You know, that, uh-huh. that electric energy that comes off of there. They're just so much more in tune with their energy bodies than we are. We have a lot to yeah, learn from she them. Does. Uh, she'll jump before the noise, and, and, and then I've got the, the dual startle of the dog jumping and then the noise. <laughs> Okay, well, that that answers that question, because I had I, I always, like, how does she know it's going to happen and jump before the noise? And that, that does make very, very much sense. Now, you know, another thing that you talk about on your website, and I've seen some of your newsletters where you have stuff about it, is uh, feeding your pets. Do you have specific things that you recommend to people? Uh, yes, and uh, because... If, if they're asking me to help with, you know, something that's going on, an issue, I have to kind of look at the whole picture. And diet is so important to the health of our animals um, and us. <laughs> but it's so important, and there's just so much junk out there that we've been feeding them for so many years. I recommend a raw diet. I feed my dogs raw diet. And um, now there are so many wonderfully commercially prepared raw diets that... Um, You know, for those that aren't as adventurous to just go to the butcher shop and buy some meat and, you know, figure out the balancing of all of that, um, there are those that are prepared. Um, And is it more expensive? Um, It's about equal with the premium dry foods, I think, for the most part. Uh, Depending on the size of the dog, sometimes it can be more expensive. But if you look at what it saves you in, you know, in vet bills and, and medicine costs, I think it's well worth it. I mean, people are always... Well, you know, I know one thing. Working with pet dogs in the New Orleans area, you see so many dogs with severe allergy problems um, requiring lots of medication. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of dogs with uh, severe hip problems. I see a lot... And, you know, often these are mixed breeds and rescues, so it can't be... You know, typically I hear people say, oh, it's inbreeding because it's a purebred dog. No, these are often mixed breeds as well. They'll have allergies um, resulting in itching, ear infections, uh, missing patches of skin, hot spots, chewing on their paws. Yep. Um, they'll have liver problems. They have the hip problems. They have bad teeth. They have horrible breath. Uh, ear infections are, are rampant. Mm-hmm. That's partly because of our humidity, so any dog with folded ears is going to be prone to uh, yeast infections in their ears simply because of a lack of, of air movement. Mm-hmm. But, um, well, you know, are, are these though, things that can be addressed? Pardon? Are these all things that can be addressed with um, diet? Because I've often questioned why are these things so much sev- more severe here versus in rural Arizona where I lived and the dogs were lucky if they got uh, no name grocery store brand dog food. Well, I think diet is a big part of it. 
But there are other things that stress the dog or the cats or the horse's environment. And when I say environment, I mean um, their body. So, uh-huh. one, they need, the good, they need the good nutrition. Because if you feed them foods that have corn and soy and any, you know, any food that's a dry dog food, even the more premium one, it's all cooked. I mean, all of the nutrition is out of it, and then they have to add stuff back in. So it's like us eating cereal, you know, every day, and that, you know, you have to have some live food. But that's one piece of it. But also, you know, is their home life happy? Are they getting the exercise they need? Um, Are they being given all kinds of flea and tick preventatives and wormers? And, And I'm not saying none of those should be good given, but we tend to really overdo those things, and we overdo vaccinations quite a bit, too. So all of those things, and then we start giving them medicine because they've got this problem and that problem, so now we're giving them a whole bunch of drugs, and the body never has time to balance itself. It's, you know, overloaded with toxins, and it it doesn't have the ability to recuperate from it. Uh Uh-huh. So... So you kind of you have to look at all of those things. But a clean diet is one of the best ways to clear a lot of it up. And then you have to get them back in balance. And that's I use the essential oils. You know, you talk about the yeasty ears, and from a traditional Chinese medicine standpoint, that's looking at generally excess heat, damp heat, and that needs to be cleared out of the body. So then it's not only a matter of feeding them good clean diet but then it's also a matter of what food you're feeding them because now you need to feed them cooling foods because they already have this excess heat so you know so kind of looking at that whole picture uh-huh. but I, the dog that I just adopted she was surrendered she's this beautiful little West Highland Terrier two and a half years old smart as can be sweet as can be um, and she was surrendered because she has all of these allergies and she came with the blood test that showed everything that she was allergic to. Uh-huh. And I put her on a I put her on a raw diet. I put her on a product that um, a vet developed out in the Seattle area that helps um, the body get rid of toxins and also supports it with um, antioxidants to support the immune system. And she has I mean, I you can't tell she has allergies. And that's why she was surrendered. Uh huh. And I've seen that often, where dogs are surrendered or put down. Well, a lot of people don't realize that surrendering your dog as a pound is almost always a death sentence. Your little West Highland White is very, very lucky. But uh, very few dogs that are surrendered are actually that lucky, unless they're surrendered at a no-kill shelter. Right. And they're kind of rare. Um, so, you know, uh, usually the allergies can result in a death sentence, mm-hmm. just like other health problems result in a death sentence, uh, partly because people cannot afford the medication for uh, long-term health problems often, and also because people don't want a, uh, a defective dog, and that's what they're regarded as is mm-hmm. defective. And that's rather unfortunate. Um I volunteer with a no-kill rescue group and and uh, see some bad stories. And there's always more dogs that need help than what there is money and space to avail- available to help, unfortunately. Uh-huh. Now, um, we are getting down to where we only have about four minutes left in the program. For people who are interested in exploring raw diet, what kind of resources are available to help them learn what benefits and how to do it. There's a lot of information on the Internet. Um, And there are, here in Wisconsin, there are a couple of companies that produce um, a really good quality commercial raw diet. So I'm very fortunate that way. And they have information on their website, too. So if you go to the companies that produce it, that's one avenue. But there's a lot of information, and there are books out there, too. Um, There are some holistic vets that have good information, and I wish I could remember that one book, but I'm not. So well, you know, we've, we've had so many developments. Um, Twenty-some years ago, I had a boxer that had issues, and I was struggling with trying to keep her healthy and whatnot, and 
this is the lakes I was going to. I lived in Arizona, central Arizona at the time. I drove an hour and a half to meet the truck, bringing in my raw dog food. Uh, because I had to meet the truck because the feed store where I was getting it did not have a freezer. And then I would I had to buy a 50-pound case at a time, and then I had to transport it that hour and a half home. And it came in one-pound packages, um, and it was a bloody mess because it always started thawing before I got home. I mean, I'm driving at 120 uh-huh. degrees. I mean, it's going to thaw. Um, and I carried it in the back of the truck simply because it made such a huge mess. I just hose it out there. Um, you know, and, and Yukonuba dog food cost me about $2 a pound. Keep in mind that at that time I could buy hamburger, good quality hamburger meat, for about 90 cents a pound. Uh-huh. And Yukonuba was at that time the best dog food that was available. There weren't very many premium brands. And I actually remember when the very first PetSmart opened on... Uh, baseline in, uh, in the Phoenix area, and it was, like, wonderful because all of a sudden I have more choices <laughs> because there weren't choices. I mean, like I said, I drove an hour and a half to get this particular food to feed her, and I remember traveling, and I thought that I would be able to get, because I thought you know, but it was nationally distributed. I was traveling to the Midwest, Upper Plains States. And I thought I would be able to buy the food there and discovered that I couldn't. Nobody had it. Uh, within 100 miles of where I was at, nobody carried it. And, you know, food, dog food's come so far since then. We have so many more choices. We have more choices about where to buy it. Uh, we can even buy it online. Yep. And there, and for, for people who really just, for whatever reason, can't deal with the raw, even if you cook it a little bit, that's better than a kibble. Well, or I know from doing research, the there are can. there's dehydrated raw as well. Yes, that's so you true. don't have the bloody mess. You don't have mm-hmm. to look at that. Um, so it's it's dehydrated and neatly packaged in, in in cellophane, so you don't even have to look at it. Now, ladies, we are down to the end of the wire. So, Wendy, would you please give your website one more time? WendyWolf.com. Okay, and Angelica? Angelica'scards.com. Okay, well, I hate to say it, but we have hit the end of our time together. I want to thank Angelica Del Mar for joining us tonight and being such a fantastic co host. And I would like to thank Wendy Wolf for joining us and being such an interesting guest. Thank you both very, very much. I've enjoyed the program tonight with both of you very much, and I hope all of you have as well. And that it's provided you plenty of food for thought and more illumination for your personal journey towards truth. Join us again next week for another episode of The Dawn of Shades. sure to be a fascinating conversation. Check out our website, www.exogenynetwork.com, and see who our upcoming guests are. With that, we are out of time. I'm your host, Gia Scott, and good night. This is George Norrie inviting you to join me at X Conference 2010, the weekend of May 8 and 9 at the National Peace Club in Washington, D.C. Is the U.S. government withholding the truth about extraterrestrials engaging the human race? Could formal disclosure about extraterrestrials take place during the Obama administration? This and more will be covered at X Conference 2010.